colleagues, friends, honored guests, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for coming uh, tonight. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer. Before I do that, a word of thanks and a few words about Professor Mikhail Ivanovich Rostovsev. I start first with a warm thank you to my colleague, Professor Colleen Manasa in the Near Eastern Language and Civilizations Department uh, for designing the beautiful poster advertising this lecture. I think many of you have seen it. Um, Colleen is at the moment uh, in the middle of the Western desert of Egypt somewhere, um, but I extend my heartfelt thanks to her um, at this point anyway. Um, Mikhail Ivanovich Rostovsev was indeed a titan of ancient history and one of the greats of 20th century historical scholarship. He taught at Yale from 1925 until his retirement in 1944. He was one of the only ancient historians to serve as president of the American Historical Association. He did so in 1935-1936. He was a world authority on Hellenistic and Roman history and wrote widely on ancient historical subjects, particularly in the field of economic history. He was an expert on the history of South Russia and the Ukraine as well, um, and the art and archaeology of Dura Europis. Rostovsev began study of the ancient world with a thesis on Pompeii, followed by a master's thesis on the scintillating subject of tax farming in the Roman world. Um, and his PhD uh, was on the economic history of Rome, using lead tesserae as a primary source. The collapse of the Romanov Empire and the triumph of Leninist Bolshevism, apart from determining his view of the Roman Empire, uh, drove him from Russia in 1918. He first spent two years at the University of Oxford before in 1920 leaving uh, for a chair at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he was from 1920 until 1925. He describes these years at Madison as the happiest years of his life. They were indeed very productive. He wrote seven chapters in those five years alone for the very influential first edition of the Cambridge Ancient History. In 1925, Rostosov became Sterling Professor of Ancient History and Classical Archaeology at Yale, where he publishes two greatest works, The Social and Economic History of the Roman Empire in 1926, followed by The Social and Economic History of the Hellenistic World in 1941, both of which have left an indelible mark on the practices of ancient history to this day. Beyond that, in 1927, he undertook and directed the Yale excavations at the important site at Dura Europus, which had a profound and long-lasting impact on the composition of the classics department here at Yale. Professor Rostosev's widow, Sophie Kulazitsky, bequeathed a generous sum to the classics department for the promotion of research in archaeology and ancient history. And part of this fund is used to support the visit of a leading figure in ancient history each year around Rostovsev's birthday, which we celebrate tonight. The lecture meets informally with faculty and students, and indeed, Ian will be around tomorrow morning, too, in the Classics Department on the fourth floor if you'd like to come and say hello and have a chat. Uh, and I believe there's no more fitting uh, person to serve as the Rostovsev lecturer than tonight's speaker. Ian Morris is interested in understanding why the West has dominated the Earth for the last few centuries. He began his career as an archaeologist and an historian of ancient Greece, studying early texts and excavating sites around the Mediterranean. Uh, in recent years, though, he's moved toward larger scale questions and an evolutionary approach to world history. He has written or edited an astounding 11 books. The most recent, Why the West Rules, for now, asks how geography and natural resources have shaped the distribution of wealth and power around the world across the last 20,000 years, and how they will shape our future. That book is coming out, by the way, in uh, the fall of this year, or the fall of 2010. <clears throat> Morris's ongoing projects include a book on slavery and globalization, a study of Western civilization co-authored with the historian Neil Ferguson of Harvard University, and a volume of the forthcoming Cambridge History of the World. From 2000 through 2006, Professor Morris directed Stanford University's excavations at Monte Polizzo in Sicily, a native Sicilian town of the 7th and 6th centuries BC. 
as well as suggesting new ways of thinking about how indigenous peoples responded to ancient Greek colonialism, the project's finds have opened up new perspectives on the similarities and differences between periods of imperial expansion in ancient and modern times. Ian Morris came to Stanford from the University of Chicago in 1995, and since then has served as Associate Dean of Humanities and Sciences there, as Chair of the Classics Department, as Director of the Social Science History Institute, among many other activities. He has founded and has directed the Stanford Archaeology Center. His teaching includes classes on world history, ancient Greece, slavery, and archaeology. He has appeared on numerous television shows, and his prizes and awards include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight, I think we're in for a real treat. Without further ado then, ladies and gentlemen, my colleague uh, and my friend, Professor Ian Morris on what is ancient history. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I, I hardly recognize myself. Um, so I hope I won't embarrass myself too much after that. Uh, so what I, I'd like to thank the Classics Department for inviting me here to uh, give the Rostov Sef lecture in honor of the great man's birthday. And thank everyone, especially Joe Manning, for looking after me so well. So I, I'm not sure what Mikhail Ivanovich Rostovsev would have made of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, Joe took me this morning to visit the great man's grave so that I could commune with his spirit. Oh, thank you. Commune with his spirit and see if I could pick up any vibes. I, I didn't pick up any vibes. Um, but I, Rostovsev was famous, like, like Joe was saying, famous for asking big questions about the ancient world. So tonight I want to ask, what is ancient history? That's my basic question. Now, I'm employed as an ancient historian, so in a way, of course, you know, it's a slightly embarrassing to stand up here and say, I don't actually know what ancient history is. But that's what I'm going to do all the same. Now, um, I think there's a, a sort of an irony to, to asking this question, what is ancient history? Because part of the reason that I think the question deserves to be asked these days is that ancient historians have been so successful at doing what they do. Their, their very success has made it a bit of a problem. And, um, well, let me explain what I mean by that. If you were to go back to the 18th century, to the age before Mikhail Ivanovich Rostovtsev, to the age of characters like this guy, um, Joachim, uh, Johann Joachim Winkelmann, the late 18th century, um, European thinkers at this point, um, 1760s, 1770s, they had a problem. And um, as problems went, it was a pretty good problem. Uh, the problem was that they appeared to be taking over the world, and they weren't sure why this was happening. So all these theorists started talking about, you know, why is this happening? Why are we taking over the world? And um, many ideas were thrown out. But one of the ones um, that proved to be most successful had the, had the best legs on it. The idea was that something very peculiar happened in Europe two and a half thousand years ago. And the peculiar thing was the origin of Greek civilization. Um, the Greeks, the idea ran, invented a unique, dynamic, um, totally unparalleled culture, nothing like it in the rest of the world. And being the descendants of this Greek culture made modern Europeans simply better than everybody else. Uh, ancient Greece was a source of um, a unique European dynamism, freedom, creativity, a whole set of values, the theory ran, which makes us superior to the rest of the world, and therefore studying ancient Greece and Rome. Um, this is a contribution to civilization by explaining what makes Europe so great. And not only does it explain what makes Europe so great, you can actually add to the greatness of Europe by helping us understand where our greatness came from and, and how we can build on it. Now, in this theory, um, ancient history was basically the history that mattered. The history of Greece and Rome between roughly 700 BCE and 300 CE, about a thousand years, this was the bit of global history that was important. Now, obviously, very few people explicitly go around saying stuff like that anymore. If you walk around university saying that kind of stuff, at the very least, people will think you're a little bit odd. Um, but that said, if you look around North American university departments, even if nobody's going around saying this stuff anymore, we are very much living in a world, uh, an intellectual, institutional world shaped by these ideas. 
the numbers of specialists at universities in North America, people working on ancient Greece and Rome, simply dwarfs the number working on any other part of the ancient world. Um, the ancient New World, ancient China, ancient India, ancient Iran, ancient Africa, um, ancient Near East, any of these fields are dwarfed by the number of specialists working on ancient Greece and Rome. At my own university, Stanford, um, you know, uh, ask any faculty member how many people work on X at your university. The answer is always it depends how you count. And it does at Stanford too. But by my count, there's 27 of us who are specialists on some part of antiquity. 19 of the 27 work on Greece and Rome. 22 of the 27 work on some part of the Mediterranean basin. Now, um, if you were Johann Joachim Winkelmann, um, that would probably seem a reasonable distribution uh, of resources and labor. Um, if you don't buy into the assumptions that the, the theory brought up in the 18th century, that distribution of resources and labor does start to seem a little bit peculiar. It, it rests on a particular set of assumptions about what really matters, about what ancient history is, how you define it, and how we should distribute the resources to pursue that definition of antiquity. So in a way, my, my question tonight is really, you know, is this the most useful way of studying antiquity? Now, obviously, plenty of people don't think this is the most useful way to study antiquity. Plenty of people will say, you know, there's a basic unity to humanity all over the world. We evolved together. Humans are the same things wherever in the world you find them. They're the legacy of millions of years of evolution. Modern Homo sapiens evolved in Africa starting around 60, 70,000 years ago, migrated out of Africa, spread all over the world. They'd filled up most of China, certainly by 40,000 years ago, Europe by 35,000 years ago, um, the New World by about 12,000 years ago. And biological evolution, of course, has continued in the last 70,000 years, but we are still basically the same creatures wherever on the planet you find us. So, taking that as our starting point, um, it might seem a bit silly to have this massive um, imbalance in the distribution of resources for studying the, the ancient history of the world. Now, there are, obviously, there are differences between Greco-Roman ancient civilizations and other ancient civilizations. You get different scripts in different parts of the world, different people doing their stuff. Um, Confucius on the left here, Herodotus on the right. I wanted to have Confucius and Homer, but I discovered that if you go to Google Image and look for Homer, there was about 200,000 images of Homer Simpson, and I couldn't actually find one of the poet Homer, which I'm sure says something very profound, although I'm not quite sure what. Um, different sorts of art in different parts of the world. Joe Dynasty, bronze uh, vessel on the left, um, Greek Kori uh, on the right. Obvious differences between different parts of the world, and no one would want to deny that for a moment. But there are plenty of scholars out there outside the classics departments and inside them too, who will say that um, these differences are just twists and wrinkles on the basic underlying similarities in a shared global evolutionary story. If you take that perspective, ancient Greece and Rome pretty much automatically lose their privileged place in the story. And there's lots and lots of books you can look at to, you know, to make this more concrete. This is not a new idea either, not some sort of radical new thing. I mean, anthropologists have been saying this for the best part of a century. Uh, if you go back, say, to, to one of the classics of um, social evolutionism, Morton Fried's book, The Evolution of Political Society, came out in 1967. Back in the dark days when I was a graduate student, all archaeologists read this book. Now, in Freed's evolution of political um, society, Greece and Rome each crop up on three out of the 242 pages. About 2.5% of the pages in this book mention ancient Greece and Rome. If you take one of the, sort of the, the Bibles of current world history, David Christian's 2004 book, Maps of Time, Greece and Rome each crop up on 16 out of the 491 pages. In that book, about 6% of the pages mention Greece or Rome. If you take Felipe Fernandez Armesto's recent huge textbook, The World, second edition came out this year, Greece comes up on 25 pages and Rome on 12 pages. So it looks like um, Greece and Rome are, are doing better, but the book has 1,056 pages. Greece and Rome come up on less than 4% of the pages in this book. That's not a lot. Um, Beth Pollard, uh, an ancient historian at San Diego State, read a very interesting article, came out in the journal Classical World in 2008, and she looked at what's happened to the teaching of Greco-Roman history in high schools over the last 20, 30 years. And what she found is, um, varies from state to state, but pretty much everywhere, it's been subsumed into 
um, larger either social studies courses or else it gets reduced to being one example of a range of pre-modern agrarian societies. And you can study Greece and Rome, but often Greece and Rome will be an interchangeable unit. You can study Han China instead or Maori and India or maybe sort of two out of a batch of half a dozen ancient agrarian societies. Um, people are very rarely required in high schools to study Greece and Rome anymore. Now, the bluntest statement of this uh, is one that comes from a wonderful book by a historian and geographer named Al Crosby, uh, published a book 20-some years ago called Ecological Imperialism. It's a great book, and I recommend it very highly to everybody. Um, and I want to cite it because it is the bluntest statement, but I think it also makes explicit what a lot of people feel implicitly. Crosby says at one point in his book, between that era when agriculture was invented and the time of development of the societies that sent Columbus and other voyagers across the oceans around 1500 CE, roughly 4,000 years passed, during which little of importance happened. That's all you need to know about ancient history. Little of importance happened. So in the, the Crosby view of things, not only are Greece and Rome a small part of antiquity, there's actually nothing much about antiquity worth dwelling on anyway. So, hence my question, what is ancient history? Um, is it uh, just a very, very tiny thing, or is it the secret to understanding the whole planet? Now, um, to set up the talk, and to keep it reasonably short at least, um, I thought I would try to simplify the theories down to like three competing answers to the question of what is ancient history. I'm sure you can think of other possible answers too, but this um, I found a, a useful organization. The first of these, what I'll call the standard model, um, that there was a unique, uh, particularly Greek, but Greco-Roman achievement, uh, which was developed and then spread around the ancient Mediterranean world by the Roman Empire, passed on from the Roman Empire until it reached the pinnacle of civilization in the modern West. Here we have the pinnacle of civilization. This was taken um, in the town I was born in, in the month I was born. The hospital I was born in is just off the picture to the left. Now, because of the level of pollution in Stoke-on-Trent, you can't tell what time of day this is, uh, but I like to tell myself this was taken as I was being um, being born into this world which may or may not be true pinnacle of civilization though but of course I jest here is the pinnacle of civilization okay so that's the first theory the standard model second simplified theory the global model as I'll call it the Greece and Rome are simply examples of agrarian empires and that's all there is to say about it third model the Crosby model nothing really happened in ancient history so let's stop now and go straight to the reception Okay, so what I want to do is just talk about these three theories. And I want to say before I launch into this, um, my, my goal in doing this is not to try to debunk Greco-Roman history. I, when I was a graduate student, it was very fashionable for a while for people doing Greek or Roman history to go around saying what nonsense Greek and Roman history was. The implication being, of course, that we are all so sophisticated that we've risen above our, our moronic peers and can see the world better. Um, that is, is not what I'm trying to do here. I think, though, that something is happening to our field. Real and important changes are underway, and Beth Pollard's article makes that very, very clear. Um, whether we like it or not, our field is changing more rapidly now than at any time since the late 18th century. And we have the choice of getting out in front of this and understanding it and taking leadership in these changes or not. Uh, and that, I think, is the real issue. Do we want to be leading what happens to our field, or do we want it to be driven by other people? So, okay. These three simplified representations of, of theories out there about what ancient history might be. Now, I think the only way po you can possibly adjudicate between three theories like this is comparatively. Um, if we start off just by sort of looking very general terms, what was happening across ancient Eurasia uh, in, say, the first millennium BCE, we see some pretty interesting patterns, some striking similarities as well as differences. One thing that we see in the area on this map between the thick black lines marking to the way the major ancient old world civilizations were, pretty much everywhere between the thick black lines in the first millennium BCE, population roughly doubles. And it varies around the doubling figure, but somewhere in that order, it roughly doubles. Striking similarities. Pretty much everywhere, not surprisingly, we see agricultural intensification going on. And more irrigation, more manuring, um, more use of plows. Here, a Greek example in Chinese examples um, on this picture. Um, we see much more intensive agriculture altogether. Extreme example, of course, the Roman aqueducts. And here you see one marching mile after mile across the desert of, of what's now Tunisia. 
We see the spread of iron technology across this whole area here, iron tools. I'm not sure why I put this slide in, except that I have it. I'm sure you know what iron tools look like. We see the spread of iron technology and the level of use of iron all across this area. We see uh, the, the spread of things like water mills, say, alternative sources of power. Again, all across this band. Extreme example, once again, from the western end. And this is just a couple of reconstruction drawings of the famous Barbagal water mill in Rome. At full power, this would give you roughly the same energy output as two Model T Fords running at full power. And for an agrarian society, that's a lot of energy output. But similar but less ambitious water mills you'll find all across this area of Eurasia. Um, see the spread of writing all, all across Eurasia, uh, more intensive use of it, new forms of it. Uh, again, there's Western examples here, the spread of the Greek alphabet, uh, the green air, or sort of we guess we've got brown and darker brown, uh, the way the, the slide is coming out. So the lighter brown areas on the map up at the left showing you where the Greeks are colonizing, darker brown where the Phoenicians colonize. Down at the bottom left, a, a famous uh, example, one of the earliest examples of the Greek alphabet around 750 BCE, very, very clearly derived from the Phoenician script before it. This alphabet spreads out around the Mediterranean basin. There's a huge spread in writing in China after about 600 BCE, um, rapid spread in India after about about 500, rapid expansion of trade, the use of coinage across all of these areas in the first millennium BCE, steady growth in the size of cities all across this band of Eurasia across the first millennium, um, say around 1000 BCE. The biggest city at the western end of Eurasia is probably Susa, uh, 25,000 people maybe. Uh, the eastern end is probably the city of Chi, maybe about 35,000 people. By the end of the first millennium BC, you've got probably half a million people in Chang'an in China, 300,000 perhaps in Alexandria, probably a million in the city of Rome. Here, Mussolini's famous uh, model of the city of Rome. The enormous growth in cities all across this band. Um, enormous increase in armies and their size and power. Uh, at the western end of Eurasia, in, in Assyria, we see the replacement of chariots by cavalry by about 800 BCE, the introduction of mass infantry armies with iron weapons over the next century or so, here more Assyrians getting very angry with each other. Um, by, say, about 250 BCE, the Romans and Carthaginians can mobilize several hundred thousand troops at a go. And I didn't have any good Punic War slides, so this is you know, slightly later, but you know, Romans doing what Romans are best known for here. Similar sort of things going on the eastern end of Eurasia. Uh, cavalry replacing chariots, and here the famous chariot from the Qin first emperor's tomb. By 600 BCE, cavalry more or less replaced chariots. Mass infantry armies by 500 BCE, armies hundreds of thousands strong by 250 BCE again. And here we've got the former first family visiting the former first emperor's tomb, uh, the, the famous terracotta army here. State reorganization going on all across this band of societies, the growth of bureaucracy all across this band of societies. It's a remarkable set of similarities across the complex societies of first millennium BCE Eurasia. Now, okay, the reason I launched into that little soliloquy there about um, similarities across Eurasia is uh, to give an example, though, of some of the difficulties of thinking about these kinds of similarities and differences. Like anybody could come up here and stand here and blather on for 50 minutes about similarities, or I could give you a list of differences, and this would all be very easy to do. The problem with this is that it's a very messy, highly subjective kind of process. Um, and by, when I say subjective, what I mean specifically is it's riddled with assumptions that are difficult to make explicit. So if I stand up here and rattle off this list of similarities, it'd be very different for, very difficult for a rival historian who didn't agree with me to come and um, you know, pin me down on why some things are being chosen, why not others. So um, because of that, what I've been trying to do the last few years, I've been thinking about this problem for a little while now, and it seemed to me that the way to make some progress with these comparisons and looking for what the, how important are the similarities, the way to make some progress would be to, to reduce the process of comparisons to something a bit simpler and more direct and more explicit. Not necessarily more objective, but more explicit in that the assumptions have to be spelled out a bit more to make it easier for us to have the argument instead of arguing endlessly over what the assumption should be. And to me, it seemed that the obvious way to do this was by finding something we could measure. I mean, any of you who've been, had the unfortunate experience of reading any of my work will know I, I tend to assume this about most problems. If you can find something to measure, you begin to force people to confront each other on the same issues. 
So I decided one useful thing to measure in the different societies across Eurasia in the ancient period would be their levels of social development. And then we can compare these and ask ourselves, is there something really distinctive about Western Eurasia, like the standard model says, are the differences across this area really very small, the way the more global model says, or is the whole thing boring and pointless, the way the Crosby model says? So what I mean when I say social development, because I think it, it's important to be um, explicit about these things. Um, and I should say one of my pet hatreds is people who read PowerPoint slides out. But this is now what I'm about to do. Um, what I mean by social development is basically society's ability to get things done. And so to, to make it a bit more formalized, uh, the, the bundle of technological, subsistence, organizational, and cultural accomplishments through which people feed, clothe, house, and reproduce themselves, explain the world around them, resolve disputes within their communities, extend their power at the expense of other communities, and defend themselves against others' attempts to extend their power. So a bit of a mouthful, but I wanted to get it all into one sentence. I thought that would sound better. Um, Social development, it's basically a group's ability to master its physical and intellectual environment. And in principle, at least, this is the sort of thing that ought to be measurable and comparable, acro comparable across time and space, and it allows to put the discussion on a more solid footing. Now, um, social development is obviously not the only thing you can look at if you want to try to be a bit more explicit about the comparisons. But I found it a very useful way to, to sort of crack into this question, open things up to get into. So um, in order to, to come up with some kind of measurement of social development, what I decided to do was to boil it down into four traits that I think we can look at, which m I think more or less cover the range of what I'm talking about in this definition here. And the four traits I settled on, which I chose partly for their ability to cover what we're talking about, partly for uh, th them being things that we can at least up to a point measure a bit. The four traits were energy capture, by which I mean how much energy per capita is consumed by people each day in different parts of the world world at different times. Levels of organization, and for that I chose, a, like a lot of social scientists do, the proxy variable of urbanization. and just took the size of the biggest city in each part of the world at different times uh, as just a, a rough guide to how much organization is out there. Um, their information technology, like the, the, uh, which for most of the periods means um, uh, the techniques of literacy, of storing information and distributing it, of how many people are able to read and write and send things around. And then their war-making capacity, which again, I think, within very rough limits, can be measured. And so to, to, to play my little game with these variables, I assigned a maximum of up to 250 points for each variable, so it's a total possible score of 1,000 points on my development scale. Now, there's enormous room, as I'm sure you can imagine, for, for arguments uh, between specialists over whether it's possible to score these things, how you actually do the scoring, what the number should be. Um, but that said, I, 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 I love that kind of stuff. That's my idea of fun, is, is arguing with people about that. Um, within certain limits, I think we can pull together the archaeological and textual evidence and very roughly measure these things across time. Um, now, this sort of research, obviously, it, it's what one of my colleagues at Stanford likes to call chainsaw art. Um, it's not like being Rembrandt or something, yeah, all, all the little details exactly right. You know, if you ask me, are your development scores right? The answer is no. Everything I'm about to tell you is wrong. But that doesn't matter. Because the real question is, how wrong are they? Are they wrong enough that it throws everything off? Or are they just wrong enough that we can sort of live within, uh, live with the problems and the in inaccuracies? Are they within our tolerances for error for the kind of problems we're trying to solve? Now, I will happily bore you with um, all the details if you ask, but I, I won't intentionally set out to bore you. If I'm boring you, that's accidental. Um, and so, uh, but if you are interested in all these details, I'm happy to blather on at great length uh, at the end of this thing. But basically, um, it seems to me uh, there are other things you could try to measure. There are other ways you can measure these from the ways um, that I'm trying to measure them. But pretty much any way of measuring that stays close to mainstream scholarly opinion actually produces more or less the same results at the end of the day. There's always going to be differences, but not enormous ones. Okay, final thing I, I want to say um, in, in this part of the talk. Um, if we go back to the end of the Ice Age, say roughly about 15,000 years ago, and look at the world 15,000 years ago, there's half a dozen places around the world where more complex societies begin to develop. And uh, they're marked on this map. 
And, and over the last few years, I've been looking at these regions, trying to trace the development of complex societies out of them and its expansion geographically across the last 15,000 years. But an, an interesting thing struck me, that across almost the whole of the last 15,000 years, the societies with the highest social development scores always came from one uh, of two of the original half dozen regions, which are the ones marked as the hilly flanks and the yellow Yangtze valleys um, on this map. The area that began in the hilly flanks, this expanded outward, uh, incorporated the ancient Mediterranean, Greek and Roman civilizations, ended up incorporating modern Europe, uh, the Americas, following what I think is common sense. I'm going to call that the, the Western area, since it begins at the Western end of Eurasia. The other area, the Yellow Yangtze Valleys area, that of course expands outward, incorporates Korea, Japan, uh, partially at least Southeast Asia. I'm going to call that the Eastern area for, the, again, what I think is the very good reason that it's at the Eastern end of Eurasia. Okay, so um, the reason I tell you that, uh, to keep the, the talk manageable and finish it up reasonably on time, what I'm going to do in the rest of my time is just compare these two regional traditions across the last 15,000 years. I think I can narrow my what is ancient history question down to just a two-way comparison here. Um, there's more we could do. We could make it more subtle and nuanced, but a two-way comparison, I think, gets to the basic points. Um, the question becomes... Was Western ancient history really as distinct from Eastern ancient history as the standard model, the Greco-Roman standard model, would assume? Or was Western ancient history really as similar to Eastern ancient history as the global model would assume? Or is the whole thing really as boring and pointless as the Crosby model would assume? So, okay, now that, that's enough preamble, or you may be saying at this point that's too much preamble. What do we actually get um, if we do all these things I'm going on about? Well, this is what we get. This is my graph. Now, you look at this graph and you may be thinking, that is a rather disappointing graph, particularly because the lines are supposed to be more different colors, uh, more red and blue. They're kind of blue and purple, but what can, what can you do? Um, rather disappointing graph. It's hard to see very much on this graph, unless your eyesight is a whole lot better than mine, which, of course, it may well be. Um, hard to see very much on this graph. And, and that, though, I think tells us two quite interesting things right away. I think the, the first thing that you do see on this graph is that the lines of the eastern and western lines are rather hard to distinguish on this graph. Now, that, I think, is a problem for the standard model. Um, it seems to me the standard model implies that the Western and Eastern scores really should be more different, especially in the period between about 1000 BCE and 500 CE. Second thing I think you see is that the lines are more or less flat along the bottom of the graph until about 200 years ago. They take a 90-degree turn and shoot almost straight up. Now, that seems to be, to me, to be most consistent with the Crosby model, that basically nothing happened, nothing interesting happened until the last couple of hundred years, then suddenly everything happened. Now, um, the problem is, uh, the, 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 the second of these points, um, the, the abrupt 90-degree turn around 200 years ago, that largely explains the first of these points. You can see that the, uh, the, sort of the darker line um, zips way up, way up, over 900 points, the Western score for the year 2000 CE. In order to get a 900-point score on this graph, we have to compress everything else down into the very, very bottom of the graph. The lines look very similar through most of the history of the world since the end of the Ice Age, but actually they're not. Now, this next graph, this shows you exactly the same data, but the graph stops in the year 1900 instead of the year 2000. So we only have to go up to 180 points instead of 1,000 points. And here you can see there's a lot of difference between the, here the colors came out better as well in this one, between the blue line for the Western scores and the red line for the Eastern scores. We see a number of things, I think, on this graph, a number of interesting things. One is that the Western and Eastern scores are clearly not the same. Um, the Western score has been slightly higher than the Eastern score ever since the end of the Ice Age, almost ever since the end of the Ice Age. For 90% of the time since the end of the Ice Age, the Western score has been higher. But what we also see is it's rather difficult to say that's because of anything special about Greece and Rome. The Western score had been higher for thousands of years before the period we conventionally call Greco-Roman ancient history. So, okay, what else do we see here? A couple of obvious things, I think, leap out from this graph. One is the generally upward trend in the scores. And not only are they rising, but the rate at which they're rising is accelerating as you move through time from left to right. 
Another thing we see is that the, the upward trend of the scores is not uniform. There's big disruptions in these scores. I think these are very, very important. OK, one more graph, and then I'll stop with the graphs for a little while. This graph, um, same data once again, but now just the what we would normally call, I think, the canonical ancient period, about 1,000 BCE to 600 CE. And, um, and the Western and Eastern scores, again, the Western one in blue, the Eastern one in red. What I think we see on this graph, when we zero in on our ancient period, is that we can more or less divide it into two phases. The first is the first millennium BCE, when in East and West alike, the social development scores are rising. Sometime in the early first millennium CE, or AD, or whatever you choose to call it, um, the scores in both areas start falling. They're dropping in both areas to roughly the year 400. So what I want to do now for the remainder of my time is just talk about um, a little bit about these trends um, and the, the sort of two phases, the upward phase BCE and the downward phase in the first century CE. Now, the, the upward trend in the first millennium BCE, I think there are four important things going on that drive social development upward in both the eastern and the western ends of Eurasia in the first millennium BCE. The first of these is what I'm calling state restructuring. At the beginning of the first millennium BCE, the states at both ends of Eurasia are what we might call low-end states or, or mafia states, some people will sometimes call them. You tend to get a king who sits on the top of society, who's surrounded by a group of aristocrats, and the king says to the aristocrats, bring me troops. And the aristocrats bring the troops, everybody goes off and they plunder somebody, and then they share out the plunder between them. Very cheap to run a state like this. The king doesn't need much in the way of revenue flows, because he doesn't get much revenue coming in either, because he shares it all out. Now, um, during the first millennium BCE, all across Eurasia and the complex societies, there's a shift from the low-end model toward a high-end model, where you get rulers who run bigger and bigger bureaucracies, who tax their states more and more efficiently, who have salaried armies on the, on the king's own payroll. Um, this trend accelerates. In, in the western end of Eurasia, um, this character here, Tiglath Pileser III of Assyria, is uh, the figure normally associated with the takeoff of this trend. In eastern Eurasia, um, very much 6th, 5th, 4th centuries BCE in China and the uh, spring and autumn and warring states period. By the late first millennium, the fascinating similarities between the Roman Empire, the Qin and Han empires in the eastern end of Eurasia, Mauryan Empire in India, striking similarities by the third, second centuries BCE. Now, in this part of the story, the state restructuring, ancient Greece is really very unimportant in this story. Ancient Greek city-states were just not very powerful. Rome, on the other hand, is a very important part of this story. Rome is you know, arguably the great ancient empire. Okay, second of my four things, um, intellectual restructuring. Back in the 1940s, very famous guy, German philosopher named Karl Jaspers, um, wrestling with his sense of moral crisis at the end of the Second World War, Jaspers suggested that the first millennium BCE was what he called the axial age of world history, by which he, he meant it was the axis around the entire history, around which the entire history of the world turned. And Jaspers, um, that is a resounding phrase, he said, man as we know him today came into being in the axial age. And what he meant by that, it's something a bit difficult to, to drag out from Jaspers what he's actually saying, but what he meant by that seems to be that um, the first millennium BCE saw a broad shift away from older ideas that society was founded on some kind of pact between a godlike ruler and supernatural powers, of which, of course, uh, what's normally taken as the extreme example would be the, the pharaohs of, say, Old Kingdom Egypt, Middle Kingdom Egypt, perhaps. A shift away from that toward um, some kind of individual transcendence within a disenchanted world, an idea that nobody really has contact with the divine sphere. It's up to us ourselves to save ourselves. We see different versions of this um, going on all the way from China through India, through Iran and Palestine to the, the ancient Greek world. Now, obviously, Confucius is not the same thing as Plato. Everybody knows this. Um, but all across this area, in the, especially the middle of the first millennium, you see societies mapping out very similar spaces for debate. Uh, in South Asia, you get it with Buddhism and Jainism. In uh, China, you get it with Confucianism and Taoism. Uh, in uh, Western Eurasia, you, you get it in the Hebrew Bible, Greek philosophy, and lo lots more variants as well. They are all intensely riven by internal debates about how you transcend this world. 
in all of these areas, you'll get some people are very, very mystical about it. So like in the West, you get Parmenides. In the East, you get some strands of Taoism. You'll get some people are very empirical and practical. So in the West, you get characters like Aristotle. I mean, in the East, you get you know, some strands of Confucianism. You get some very populist versions of it. You get Protagoras in Greece, Motse in China. You get some very authoritarian versions of it, like legalism in China, some bits of Plato in the West. You get some extremely relativist versions of it, like, say, Jainism in India, Taoism in some parts of Taoism in China, the nature-culture debate in ancient Greece. Um, all of these debates, similar debates going on uh, across the old world at roughly the same time, now, Greece, of course, is very important in this part of the story. Um, Greek democracy is pretty much a unique solution to how you live in a world without godlike rulers. Greek philosophy is pretty much a unique response because it's very much responding to the unique Greek democracy. Um, but having said that, even the Greek versions of these debates, they're very much arguments within the broader range of debates we get across the whole uh, of the old world. In all of these places, the ideas are very new compared to second millennium BCE ideas. In all of them, the first millennium BCE is the age of the classics, everywhere from Greece to China. This is when the classics are written, the timeless literature that defined the intellectual terrain for billions of people for the next 2,000 plus years. Um, one conclusion we might draw from that is that if saying that ancient history is Greco-Roman history, if we think that's not the way to go, probably saying that classics is Greek and Roman literature is not the way to go either. So, okay, so all across this area, these sorts of intellectual ferments are going on. By the end of the first millennium BCE, all across this area, the restructured states are coming to terms with the intellectual restructuring. The Han Dynasty finds room for a version of Confucianism, and Confucianism, in fact, ends up becoming a kind of state ideology, almost. Um, in India, uh, the great warrior king Ashoka converts to Buddhism around 257 BCE. He, he does this because he's appalled, uh, apparently genuinely appalled, at the slaughter he himself has caused in his wars of conquest. But he converts to Buddhism in such a way that he doesn't have to give up waging war on people. Very clever conversion. At the western end of Eurasia, Roman rulers find ways to adapt Greek philosophy to their own ends. Marcus Aurelius can grow a Greek beard, fight Germans all day, go back to his tent and write the meditations all night. They all bend um, the Axial Age philosophy to their own ends by uh, the early first millennium CE. Okay, third of my big themes in the first millennium BCE is the geographical expansion of the cause. All across Eurasia, we see the growth from cities to states to empires across the first millennium BCE. This is something I've been very interested in myself. Um, like Joe mentioned, between 2000 and 2006, I directed an excavation at a little site called Montepolizzo at the western end of Sicily, a little indigenous Sicilian site. And we went there to see what happened to indigenous Sicilian society when Greek and Phoenician colonists settled uh, along the coasts of the island within sight of the, the, the uh, place where we were digging. This is a view out to the west from the, the top of the hill we were digging on, out toward the Greek, uh, to, to the Phoenician colony at Motsia, you can see it off in the far distance. So we went there to try to find out what happens to these native societies when the colonists come out. Um, we dug up all kinds of cool stuff. Um, here we are digging back in 2001 on the top of the hill. Uh, we dug up the, the main thing we focused on was a, a circular indigenous sanctuary at the top of the hill. We found goodies from all over the Mediterranean basin. Um, top left, we've got a, what people will call a East Greek B2 cut from about 575 BCE. Bottom left is an imitation of an Egyptian scarab from around 600 BCE. Bottom right is a, a local tradition bronze figurine from about 600. Top right is a Punic stele from about 300 BCE. So all kinds of goodies. We're very happy with the, the, the plunder that we pulled in. But what we realized, what increasingly dawned on us as we were doing this project, was that the, the Greek and Phoenician expansion across the Mediterranean basin, um, while there's a lot of interesting and unique stuff about it, in many ways, it's just another version of the expansion out of a core area into peripheries that you can see going on since the end of the Ice Age. We see these processes going on simultaneously in the first millennium um, BCE all across Western Eurasia, South Asia, Eastern Eurasia, um, particularly large scale in all of these places across the first millennium BCE. Everywhere you look, you're looking at a combination of migration out from a core and indigenous copying of what's going on within the core. 
all of the historiography and all of these expansions is always about exactly the same question. Is it driven by colonization or indigenous developments? And the answer in every single case is, is yes, a bit of both. And we spent seven seasons digging up this site and came to the conclusion, yes, it's a bit of both in the ancient Mediterranean. So now the Greeks are an important part of the story of the geographical expansion of the core. The Romans an even more important part of the story. Um, the, the colonization process helped draw the Mediterranean uh, base into a single core area. The Roman Empire did the same, much as was going on in Eastern Asia at exactly the same time. Okay, finally, my four topics, economic growth. Um, since the 1970s, Roman historians have demonstrated, I think very convincingly, rising levels of consumption of per capita energy capture across the first millennium BCE. In the last few years, a number of Greek historians have gotten interested in doing the same kind of thing too. Um, economic growth was the core topic of uh, a book that I edited with my colleagues Walter Scheidel and Richard Saller a couple of years ago, The Cambridge Economic History of the Greco-Roman World. We decided um, it should actually have been called the Stanford Economic History since Walter and Richard both came out to Stanford. Um, or perhaps even the Chicago Economic History because we'd all been at Chicago, as had your very own Joe Manning, um, who's a contributor to the volume, and Peter Bedford from Union College who's here tonight, another contributor to the volume, also been at Chicago. But the, the core idea in this book was that one of the things that's completely dropped out of ancient economic history is any discussion of economic growth. Even though this is the core thing that economic historians of other periods will tend to say is the most important. So by my estimates, we're working on the Greek material, by 300 BCE, the typical Greek's level of consumption was about 50% higher than it had been 500 years earlier, which is trivial by modern standards, enormous by pre-modern standards. The numbers are a bit less clear in Eastern Asia, where less quantitative work has been done, but we're dealing with very, very similar patterns. That much is clear. So, okay. First millennium BCE, characterized in East and West alike by four processes, the state restructuring, intellectual restructuring, expansion of the core, and economic growth. The idea of a unique Greco-Roman history wildly different from the rest of the world, I think begins to look less convincing once you put it in this kind of framework. Okay. Next thing I want to say a couple of words about, um, that was talking about this sort of upward slope on this graph, the first millennium BCE. Now I just want to quickly say something about the downward part of it, the, the early first millennium CE. Sometime in the first couple of centuries CE, social development starts falling in Eastern and Western Eurasia uh, and in South Asia too for that matter. Um, we get the fall of the Roman and the Han empires, uh, all kinds of stuff happening. We've got some excellent quantitative evidence from Western Eurasia, and this is a, a graph I put together from other people's work showing you in red um, the numbers of Roman shipwrecks in the Mediterranean, uh, normally taken as a proxy for the levels of trade. In blue, um, the levels of lead pollution in Spanish bogs, which is a, a pretty good proxy for certain kinds of industrial production. And as you can see, the lines march up and down um, together, rather striking correlation. And other variables we could have thrown in, the number of animal bones, the number of monumental buildings put up, the number of inscriptions preserved. Um, they don't match on perfectly, but the basic shape of all these curves is much the same. Now, um, a lot of historiography in the last 30 years, I think, has somewhat tended to obscure what's happening on the right-hand side of this graph. There's been a reaction against the old decline and fall models towards seeing what happens in, uh, certainly in the western part of Eurasia, in the early first millennium CE, as a transformation rather than the old gibbon decline and fall kind of model. And there's a lot to be said for the transformation, the cultural transformation model, but it has obscured, I think, some very, very basic economic and political realities, that social development does tumble dramatically in both East and West uh, in the first few centuries CE. By 500 CE, also the, the last thing this, I want to say about this graph, a great East-West divergence begins. Up till that point, up till the 6th century CE, Western social development was always higher than Eastern social development. In the 6th century, though, uh, the Chinese are creating a new agricultural frontier in southern China. They reunite the empire in 589. In the West, we don't get anything like that. There's a series of attempts to recreate a great empire, Justinian, the Arab conquest, Charlemagne, but no success in doing it. Western social development continues tumbling into the 8th century. For several centuries thereafter, Eastern social development is higher than Western. 
Now, okay, there's a lot more could be said, obviously, um, but I'm going to wrap up now with some quick thoughts going back to the three theories that I started from, the three answers to the question, what is ancient history? Um, having now talked a little bit about the work I've been doing the last couple of years, what does this mean for an answer to this question? Okay, the standard theory, the standard model. Greece and Rome are unique, and we should reserve the name of ancient history basically for Greco-Roman history. Well, this theory, I think, is fairly misleading. Um, the Greco-Roman world has a lot in common with other ancient civilizations. Western social development closely tracks Eastern social development. State restructuring, intellectual restructuring, geographical expansion, economic expansion, all of these are going on all across the band of complex societies across Eurasia in the first millennium BCE. All across this band of complex societies there are major disruptions at the beginning, and early to mid first millennium CE, tumbling social development for several centuries thereafter. I think it's hard to claim that what happened in the Mediterranean basin was so different from what happened in the rest of the world that we should reserve the name of ancient history for Greek and Roman history. Okay, second theory, the, the global model. <clears throat> this, I think, is also fairly misleading. Not all agrarian imperial societies are the same. Um, Western social development rises extremely high um, by the, the end of the first millennium BCE. Um, it, it reaches a level at that point that is never surpassed until the 18th century. I mean, it's like there's a, a ceiling. My, my suspicion is, is there's a ceiling beyond which agrarian societies cannot go. And in the Roman Empire, people at the western end of Eurasia were probably pressing against that ceiling. Um, in Eastern Eurasia, certainly I think by the 11th and 12th century, the time of the Song Dynasty, China is at, pressing against the same ceiling. But there is something distinctive about um, the Mediterranean basin in antiquity, something that does make it deserve special attention. Uh, it, it develops, I think, as far as an agrarian society is able to go, just subsuming it into a larger category of pre-modern agrarian civilizations. I don't think that's a very sensible strategy for historians. Okay, third model, um, the, the Crosby model. Basically, the whole thing is incredibly dull. Uh, don't waste your time on it. I think that the, this deserves the same response, um, that um, it's just rather misleading to say that nothing happened between, well, as he would say, between 2500 BCE and 1500 CE. There is a sense in which you can say that. Uh, what we got here, two last graphs to, to, to hit you with, the, the final graphs here. Up at the top, my data once again, I'm showing you the whole period from 2500 BCE to the year 2000, the whole, the whole thing. Judged from the perspective of the year 2000, you say, yes, there is something to what Crosby says. It's very hard to see anything much happening on that top graph before about 1800. The bottom graph shows you my data once again, but stopping this time of the year 1500. Um, Crosby's period, Crosby says between 2500 BCE and 1500 CE, basically nothing of significance happened. Well, I think it's very hard to take that position if you look at this bottom graph. An awful lot of stuff happens in this period. Um, and in particular, striking thing, social development in Western Eurasia is higher in the year 49 BCE, when Caesar crosses the Rubicon, than it's going to be in 1492 when Columbus crosses the Atlantic. I don't see how we can really say that the Crosby model is the answer to, to what is ancient history. So, okay, now back then uh, to the opening question, what is ancient history? I think, um, as I think will probably be fairly clear by now, ancient history should not be just Greece and Rome between 700 BCE and 300 CE. Um, say, a book I admire greatly, Moses Finley's The Ancient Economy. The Ancient Economy is just about Greece and Rome between 700 BCE and 300 CE. It's a wonderful book, but the title is utterly misleading. You know, however spectacular the legacy of ancient Greece and Rome, this is not ancient history. I think we have to conclude that ancient history is a global story. Starting in Western Eurasia around 5000 BCE, um, somewhat later elsewhere, social development starts rising at an accelerating rate. For most of the world's major civilizations, the last few millennia BCE is a time of expansion and restructuring. It's the age of the classics, especially the first millennium BCE. Um, its biggest and most vigorous in Western Eurasia rises by the first century BCE to heights that won't be surpassed until the 18th century. 
Then at slightly varying dates, but clustered in the early first millennium CE, all the major civilizations hit a ceiling, they stagnate, they begin declining. Ancient history, I would say, is the story of this first great phase of expansion and restructuring. Societies developing as far as is possible in agrarian regimes and ending in crises in the early first millennium CE. World history then heads off in a distinctively different direction in the medieval phase, when the East takes the lead. Song China returns to Roman levels by the 11th century, but no one is able to surpass the levels of social development we see in ancient Rome. The long Middle Ages, I would say, is about the straining against the limits of agrarian society by people who are very aware of this golden age in the past. Uh, you get this all across Eurasia, ending in the 18th century with a, with a breakthrough. And modern history is about the world that fossil fuels made. So, to the standard theory, I would say that we can't understand Western Eurasia without this global perspective. To the globalists, I would say that Western Eurasia was distinctive in the ancient period. And to Crosby, I would say ancient history is important. It's the bridge between the prehistoric and modern worlds. We can't understand prehistory or modern times, I think, without the ancient period in between. And that's what ancient history is. So thank you very much for listening.